you know, so so interesting, really, and so pretty. I think because really the basic shape is not is not um, pretty. But this this little doll, she's got uh, she's carrying a basket with some flowers in, and uh, what's she got? No, nothing in the other hand. And this one here, she's carrying a lovely um, sort of parasol. And is that some yeah. beautiful flowers? In that? But it's, yeah. so, yeah. it's so different to the work that. I miss about well, it's, it's clay. Both, yeah. it's sort of both ends of the scale, really, isn't yes. it? Yours is fine. Yours is more porcelain, isn't no, it? No, it isn't. I no. use the f fine uh, white earthenware, stone stone but it, that's stoneware, isn't mm. it? Yeah. Mm. But these are really, they're containers, as well as being sort of nice ornaments, because the heads come off, and uh, you've got a lovely container, you know, that, that yes. you can use mm. for... Um, with well, all, you know. Does she solely make these dolls? Just no, dolls? she makes lots of things, really. The, the, the head she makes on the wheel. She starts off the basic yeah. shape and, and, the, and the body of the yes. dolls. Yeah. This is all done on the wheel um, and the heads. And then she lets them dry and she lets them go, well, not completely dry, but to that leather stage, you know. Yeah. Um, You've lost me already. What well, leather hard, well, leather they call it. Yes, it's and it's when the clay is still damp, but you can't, it's not malleable. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes. It's got firm, yes. but it's yes. still... Um, it does look like leather at that stage, yes, doesn't it? Yes, it does. That's how does she it, fix yes. the arms at that stage, definitely? Yeah. Yes, yeah. and at that stage she uses slip, which, which is a mixture of um, sort of clay and water, um, to put, put all, the de all the decoration on at that stage. In fact, some of the detail is really, is really lovely. And when I first met her, which was at Newbury Show, she had a store there. And um, this is what caught my eye, because she was... At, she was um, actually doing pottery there, making things, doing some of the details on the on the dolls. And uh, I saw her doing this hair. And in fact, she uses um, an ordinary household sieve, you know, mm. a metal mm. sieve. And she just pushes the raw clay through it. And to see all this clay sort of worming yes. through, it, it was the really fantastic. used to do that with the stuff. Yes, you yes. make hair on the dolls. Yes. 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 And, and the worms. Yes, and that's but what you've she... done this sort of pottery, haven't you? Well, I haven't done very much of any pottery. I mean, I did some at college. Oh. And I've done a little bit. Since, so you but not yes, you probably know as much about the glazes, this type of glaze. Yes, I do, I, I'd I have do. to look it all up in my books to know which which yeah. which glaze is which and which oxide is which. Yes, but she's used um, you know some shiny and some 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 is glaze. It's some shiny and nothing yeah. about really. Yes, Ain't that's all. That's all yes. Free. So what happens when it comes out? I mean, is it that colour, that dark colour? Is that the original colour? That's, that's the, the, the colour of the clay. Of the yeah. clay. Yes. Yeah. When yes. It's baked. And, and then you paint on the white. Yes, no, that's that, a glaze. Yeah. Do you, dip it, do you dip it or paint it or what? That's well, slip and she yeah, dips them yeah, in there. Yes. And then the detail she paints on with Afterwards. oxides. And then they're fired again. Yes, because these are all underglazes except the, the one, yeah. I suppose. That's all done in one fell swoop yeah. then. Another thing I've seen is on some of the uh, bonnets, there's a kind of linen effect. Yes, so she, presses she, that? Yes. she presses that on. Well, on, that, yeah, she'd yes. probably roll it out on the linen or, or put the linen yes, on she does. and then yeah, yeah. Because then you can lift it up in one, when it's still soft. Mm. And, then and you get the impression of the linen on there. Yes. I was yes. very interested in how she came to be making them in the first place, really, because um, she'd started, I think when her children had started going to school, she went to a pottery evening class, like a lot of people do. Yeah. And got on quite well, you know, and learnt all the techniques and everything, and very and liked it very much. You know, you can go, you can do these things, and then decide, you know, it isn't for you. I thought everybody thought it's not for me. I never believed anybody really much went on from evening class. Oh no, no, no. no. And she, and she had a friend who was already an experienced potter, and this girl sort of said to her, "Well, really, you know." I think she'd already started making the dolls, yeah. and she said, "Really, I'm sure those would sell. Why yeah. don't you sort of start start it up as a little venture?" And so she got a shed at the bottom of the garden, and she's got all her, her wheel and all her clay and, and I everything. I it takes up quite a bit of room, does it? Well, it's so messy. Oh, yeah. Yes, that's yeah. right. It's messy. It's yes. nice to have it not, not attached yes. to the house. Yeah. And then she's got a kiln in her garage, and her son's a motorbike fanatic, so she Is shares the garage with him, mm. and you sort of, you know, crawl past the motorbike. But what you it's her sort of thing that if she's got a big kiln, that's the expense. Yeah. Yes. That's what you've got to consider. When, you, when you're doing something like this. Because, I mean, so many people make some lovely things. It's, it's one of the nicest things to work in, I think, Clay. Yeah. I never have done. I've got a friend who started off exactly that way, though, but she makes pots. But there's yes. something um, about them like these, a the kind of sort of um, earthy feel about them. Yeah. You know? But, I mean, she's had the same kind of training, a kind of... Um, not professional training. Would it but work? Obviously, a lot of talent. But Jill never it? makes two, any two the same. They're yeah. all different, you know. And if, if somebody says to her, "Can you make one 
whatever their particular interest is, say knitting yeah. or something, she'd, she'd do a doll doing but some knitting. But it makes them all nicer, or, doesn't or, it? Yes. Yeah. Which is lovely because it yeah. makes them you yeah. know, nice would to give. Would it work for two or three people, say, to share a kiln in one person's house, or would that. You no. need one of your You'd own. You need do you? different temperatures for yeah. different oh, things. That's the trouble. Yeah. Um, do you find that soufflés are difficult, in fact, in your, in your agar? Impossible. Because I often have to wait a day just to cook the bread, so I couldn't wait a day to cook a souffle. <laughs> I'm going to have a new one, and then I'll well, control as you, it. As you need a, a day, practically, to make a decent batch of bread anyway, to be around, not yes. to make it, but to be around, I yes. suppose it, doesn't really, it wouldn't really matter. Anyway, this one is, a, this is I think, is a very interesting souffle, because it's, uh, it's a bit different, and it's an anchovy souffle, uh, with a very nice sauce using, not your favourite ingredient, smoked cod's rose. No, I'm not, I'm not no. keen on rose of, of any kind, actually. No, well, uh, I think you'll find that in a sauce, you might like them. You might like them. So we begin by just the usual base, uh, which is one ounce of butter, one ounce of flour, cook it together, a yes. quarter of a pint of milk, yes. and three egg, yo three egg yolks, yes. beaten in. Are you all right with your arm doing that? Do you want me to? Oh, do... bless you! It's very sweet of you. Know if do you, you do the white for one? me, continue with those. I'd okay. be grateful. Okay. I can just about manage this. Okay, because you don't want the, your elbow to get any it's worse. It's terribly painful. No, I don't. And heaven only knows what I've done to it, but I shall find out tomorrow. Mm. Um, now, no salt because I'm using anchovies. Mm. Now, a tin of the flat anchovies, which I soak in milk. Just soak them in a little milk, drain off the oil, soak them in a little milk for about an hour or so, and that will draw off the surplus salt. Not water. Not milk. water. No milk. Milk is much, much better. Takes the salt away. Not funny. Then I wring them out by hand, which is a bit messy and smelly. <laughs> Put them through my old mangle. <laughs> and then crush them down into a pulp, like so, and add them to the base. So there we are. We have the, the base of the, uh, of the souffle. And meanwhile, I've got the oven at 190 or 375, which is about 5 on gas. And there is the base. Now, nice squeeze of lemon juice. Can I just uh, ask you, you yes, know when you, you said about washing the salt out of butter? Yes. You did that with water? That's right. That's this right. Is milk. This well, there's not so much. Uh, there is really not so much salt. These are anchovies, so heavily salted yes. that the alkalinity of the milk. I don't know. It seems to bring out the salt much more effectively than. Uh, I just wanted to be sure. Than water. Right now, I take a large bowl. A lot of people uh, make the base in a large saucepan and try to incorporate from there. But I think. Could you move that off, dear, please? Thank you. Um, but I think it's better to tip the base out into a. A large bowl. It's lovely to have a comet working beside me. Very Especially nice. one who knows, who knows what it's all about. Well, I know. I mean, I, mean I, I know a bit, but I mean, past uh, training at college and then teaching, yes. obviously I haven't advanced beyond that because I've concentrated on sewing, you see. Right, and how are those? Well, they're not yet. Do you want me to turn them upside down and see if it falls out? Like not I used to with school. Not exactly, just lift up the school whistle. School children, I used, to, I used to say, right, everybody turn your plates upside yeah, down. Yeah. Oh, wow, miss. <laughs> it's lovely, though, very exciting. Will well, that do me? <laughs> not quite. No, Can I carry no. on with the sauce? Yes, if you, you do could that forgive one. me. Right, well, while you're just finishing those, now, the sauce, again, a basic uh, bechamel with a one ounce, one ounce, but in this time, uh, nearly half a pint of milk, so you've got a much, a much softer uh, mixture. Can't you make right? one lot and divide it? No, no of course not really. You no, need, no, you need it much thinner. That's right. Yeah. And the smoked cod's row, which I've taken the skin off, a bit of skin, mm. and broken it up as much as I can, and then I add to the sauce about. Three ounces. Oh, of not that. very much. Oh, well, I might like not it. Then. I th I'm going to make you taste this in a moment because I think you'd like it a lot. And then you have to break that down. Now, when you reheat the sauce, don't for heaven's sake uh, boil it. Just break that down over a gentle heat if necessary. But this was boiling a moment ago, yes, which it is was. why I am. Um, yes. And it is how's that hard. coming on? It's all right. On? Yeah, Good. it's all right. I won't stop because uh, it'll go runny. Again. Some thick cream into the sauce. And again, a little more lemon juice. And this cuts the salt as well. That's it. And finally, chives. Good. Could be, uh, if you haven't chives, very finely chopped spring onion tops. Yes, right they're a good substitute, aren't they? I'm going to give you that to beat up over that, and that's marvellous. 
And thank you. Okay. Oh, you are a clever girl. Look at that. Just Look right, at, that is. Look at that. Look at that. Absolutely, Absolutely right. Absolutely perfect. Right. Okay. I feel as I should have a white cap on, you know, <laughs> around my forehead. Well, don't worry, Anne. I'll give you a job. How about that? Yes. Bet you don't pay much. No, I'm notorious for that. No, it's all in the perks. You'll get what you've made when you go home. How what about that? What are you that? saying about the eggs in this? You don't want them heated? Don't want them boiled? About the little fish row eggs? No, no, yes. no, no, no. Now, again, just reheat. That's OK. Is that all right? Carefully, yeah. carefully cut and fold. This is something that I find it difficult to teach people. They will try to break it down as they do it. Do you find that? Especially children. Yes. They're teaching children. They're yes. It's difficult to get them to do this properly. Well, because beating is an easy movement, but that isn't. No, it isn't. It, you no, don't it feel as though getting anywhere. Because you've got to bring the mixture from the bottom, from the bottom of the bowl, yeah. up onto the top, yes. like so. And then a uh, seven-inch souffle dish, the deep one, and you don't need, contrary to popular opinion, you do not need a collar on the deep souffle dish. Oh, not like the cold one you would be doing the, the other The cold week. one you do need, yeah. because it's a, a flatter dish. Yeah. And it should take, in the centre of the oven, it should take approximately 25 minutes or so. But the centre of it should be soft. In other words, rather like, uh, rather like an omelette, it should be wet in the middle. Oh, I see. Yes. But this is, the one, this is one of the ones where you've got to rush to the table as soon as it's ready, haven't you? Well, you have really, yes. I could tell you there is a, a trick that some people use, that chefs use, actually, to keep a souffle hanging about when people are being tedious. I'm not going to tell on? you about it now. <laughs> um, two little girls and then, are busy for the crown, you know that you get the classic crown as it comes up. Yes. Well, you just take your finger, your thumb, and run it round like that, around the edge, like that. You see, there's the... Ultimate. And then you put that into the oven and there is your sauce to serve with it when it's ready. An ultimate tip. There's always something, you see, which you discover for yourself and pass oh, on. Oh, it's very true. Oh, it's very true. I mean, Who the odd things out? I've learned about sewing from you, even though, even though I am no good at it, what you have told me has proved to be enormously helpful. Yeah. Yes, that's right. No, Daphne. Now... Daphne. Yes. Yes. It was funny lovely. about that. Was it a, a friend of yours who yes, found surely. you? Yes, surely. Yes. And she, she phoned and said, look, I'm trying to sew this thing. Now, my machine isn't working. It's all gathering up on the bottom. And I was supposed to... I mean, I don't know what her machine is. Um, what make it is. Yeah. Uh, and she's very vague anyway, yeah. you know, and, and trying to tell me that it was all looping on the bottom. And I said, well, take it all to bits, clean it. The tension is probably wrong. Yeah. But, but I mean, how, how can you say it on the phone? Maggie was saying that people were always saying to her the machine yeah. doesn't work, and it's, it's true, isn't it? Mm. And I said, that's absolute, absolute nonsense. One of the commonest things is, as Daphne says, that all the top thread looping on the bottom. Well, it's the bottom thread. You see, the bottom thread all. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Same thing. You yeah. see, it's, the, um, it's it, the principle of it. No matter what the machine does or how old it is or how new it is, the principle of the making of the stitch is exactly the same as it always has been. Absolutely, yes, exactly the yes. same, mechanically. I use this as a, as a teaching aid to explain how a machine makes a stitch. So that um, that's one thread you've got on one yeah. side of the fabric. You've got two layers of material. And then on the other side, you've got another thread. And I use contrast just to, to prove the point. And the, the perfect stitch is the one where the two colours loop exactly in between the two layers of material. And so therefore, if you're sewing on thick material, it's dead easy to get a mm. good stitch. Mm. If you're sewing on, sewing on chiffon, it's difficult. It is. Because it's, you know, it's not going to form exactly in the middle. If you're stitching on single material, like when you're zigzagging seams to neaten them, it's very difficult because you haven't got your two layers. Yeah. This is where people get confused. Sometimes I have found on thin materials that one of the threads, sometimes the bottom one, will look as if it's just straight across with no indents. Oh, that's no. right. That's well, you and see, the top one yes. is it doesn't matter which indent. is top or bottom. Yeah. Do you see? Yeah. It, sh it, it shouldn't doesn't matter. matter. It, it doesn't matter. No. Suppose I loosen this blue one terrifically. Suppose when it's threaded up, it's not controlled and there's a lot of blue. Yeah. What's going to happen is that that red, top or bottom, is going to pull that blue through. You see? Because there's so much of it. So you're going to get blue as well on this side. Yeah, mm. yeah. And lots of blue there. I find this happens more so if I'm trying to do a zigzag stitch. I don't know why. Well, then you do need to make an adjustment 
for a zigzag. Mm. That sounds as though it's your particular machine yes. that needs a bit of checking mm. up on. But you see, whatever sort of machine it is, the first thing, if, if it doesn't make a good stitch when you test it, and I always test it on a bit of fabric, always, the first thing is to unthread it and start again. Assume there isn't anything wrong and you've just made a mistake threading. And you know how on plastic reels you get a nick in the plastic? Mm. Make sure that is at the opposite end of the threading because one of the main causes of, of, of breaking stitches and so on is that the thread gets caught in that nick. Yeah. See? It's so, so simple when you say it. It's so logical, But you see, it? that's modern because yeah. we never used to have these reels, did we? No, just the other ones had a nick, have yes. a nick in them yes. as well. So, yeah. so the nick's at the bottom yes. there on that one. You then thread it according to your particular make of machine. Now the top thread, this green one, goes through a number of controls which make sure that when you pull it, it just comes yeah. through with slight pressure running but against you. That's the one that's important, the tension one. They're both, they are both important. Yeah. And they're both under tension. Both threads yeah, are yes. under tension. But I mean the one with the numbers on. Yeah, well this one, you see, this top one is controlled by one particular screw. You can't sit here because it's hidden in there. It's two discs together like that and the thread goes in between. Mm. Now, if when you try it out, the discs are too tight, it's going to stop the green thread getting yeah. through. So you just loosen it, but you don't go whirling and whirling. You turn that so that it's loosened yeah. just by a little Sometimes fraction. it doesn't seem to have much effect on mine. I don't know. Well, that's well, your, your something machine. Else. Yeah. Yeah. My yeah. machine's different to that one. My machine's got a, a round thing, almost like a clock face in the mm. front. Mine has on two the front, with numbers still on. with the yes. numbers. Yes. Yes. So what yes. number would it be on, say, for a, for a moderate weight material? It, it's the middle number middle of number. whatever okay. range of numbers you've yeah. got, you see. Mm. And then you adjust it slightly to one side or the other but not by masses mm, and masses. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So then you've got the underneath thread. So having checked that, you see, you've then got your underneath thread. And um, it can be one, a spool that fits into one of those holders. There are all sorts of methods. Yeah. But whatever you do, if it's this one, you should be able to get hold of it. And as you just gently jiggle it, it should slide down the thread. Mm, this one is gradually. a bit tight, see? So I can loosen it with that screw there. Some of them now have uh, a screw which you can just loosen with your thumb like that. Oh, yes. But it's only a fraction. Mm. It's not wide. I'm no, so surprised, Mary, to, to meet him again. He'd been such a dreadful, dreadful five-year-old. But I thought at 11, that, you know, he'd be equally bad. But he'd been away to boarding school. And all his mother's spoiling to me seemed to have not made any difference, and I was quite surprised about that. I you mean, he, he turned into a nice child instead of a horrid yes, child? Yes, it was I quite see. pleasant <laughs> sort of... Child. That's all very well, of course, oh, if, it, yeah. uh, if it works for the child. I mean, I know. A child was sent away to boarding school and it, it, it destroyed him. Totally, totally destroyed really? him. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. It, uh, you know, you can't, you can't make hard and fast rules for children. It also depends entirely upon what you mean by spoiled. In what way was he spoiled? Well, he was just so very... I, I, I couldn't quite believe it. He would say... I want an egg for my tea, and she'd give him the egg, and he'd go splat, and this egg would go off, and she'd pick it up and say, "Oh, now I've got to cook another egg," and things like that. And he would just kind of splat that oh, one. Was, was five. five. Yes, and he'd, he'd kind of walk past and kick you, and she'd sort of say, "Oh, don't do that," instead of giving <laughs> him a good kick back. I, I felt that was spoiling. Really. Instead of you giving him a good kick well, back, I I've, done, to, I've I done that in the past with children. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think that everyone hates spoiled children. Don't they? Yes. yes. Oh my God, I can't stand it. Yeah. But they don't think of hating the children who have produced the child. It's the, the parents' fault. It's not the. You can't blame the child. For no, of course sport. you can't, and I don't. I, you know, I, I think oh, I. Oh yes, I think everyone does. A lot it? of people. Well, a lot of people do. They don't like the child, obviously, no. because it's so hideous. Yeah. But uh, I mean, anyone with a grain of intellect knows that it. They, you know, that that it is the parents that have ruined mm. the child. But there are different ways of spoiling a child. I mean. Um, I'll spoil mine by allowing them certain privileges, like staying up late, say. Or I might decide to buy them something really quite expensive for Christmas. I brought my son a microscope, say. Mm. And I don't, I don't consider that spoiling them. But I, I can't bear to see children screaming in supermarkets um, and getting away with it. I mean, screaming for, say, a bar of chocolate and being given the bar of chocolate 
Well, I feel it should be given a good smack and stir. Well, at least the mother's... Yes, I mean, if it's got to the screaming point, at least the mother is trying not to give in. I mean, that's better than just <laughs> yes, immediately quite. buying it before it starts. But you yes. feel yes. really my... dreadful, don't you? I, mean, I think each of mine, at, at some stage, has done that in a yes. shop where mm -hmm. I wouldn't buy them something they wanted and they just had a tantrum. At that age when they have tantrums, yes. you know. Yes. And you feel so awful when everybody turns around and glares at you as though it's your fault that the child's screaming. And, in fact, you're trying to assert yes. your discipline and, and, and not let them get spoiled. Well, what interests me... I don't know if you know about this, Maggie. Uh, I meant to ask Vida about it at some stage. Apparently, Italians um, spoil their children, in, in our sense of the word, up to the age of about five. Yes. Up to five, yes, the family, grandmothers and so on, let the baby do exactly what it likes. Yeah, I'm, but I from remember five onwards, suddenly they're disciplined. I remember right? what a shock. Yes. I, don't, no, I don't think it works really that way. I think what happens is that a second child comes along and suddenly number one isn't numero uno anymore, is number mm. two. Mm. My niece, um, who was terribly spoiled, I mean to the extent that she would literally lie down on the floor in a supermarket until she got, say, the most expensive toy there. Mm. And that everybody would go in the checkbooks, get her it quickly, please write a check, let's have this toy. And I remember standing in amazement and thinking, well, this is ridiculous. This is Italian. Italian. Yeah, this child's an absolute tyrant at three and four mm. and five. And my immediate reaction was to smack her in the behind mm. hard, you know. Mm. And yeah, I couldn't I understand why I got, where I got aerated. But still, her, her, her brother was born.